Okay. Well, we are absolutely thrilled at Rockford University to uh, have with us today probably one of the most preeminent thinkers um, of this century and, and perhaps the last century uh, in America. Uh, Noam Chomsky is known as an American linguist, philosopher, cognitive scientist, historian, social and political critic, an activist. He's the father of modern ling uh, linguistics. Um, and his one of his famous quotes is, quote, education is a system of imposed ignorance, uh, end of quote. So here we have uh, the father of, of modern linguistics and experts on, on how people communicate uh, with each other, uh, who has authored uh, more than 100 books. And what's really great about uh, Dr. Chomsky is the fact that his books are so easy to read. He uses such plain language uh, as he understands the intercommunication between and among individuals. So uh, Dr. Chomsky, we are absolutely thrilled to have you with us today at Rockford University. And as I mentioned, that we are using your book, uh, Who Rules the World, as, as one of our texts because we consider it to be so important. Please. Very pleased to be with you. Go ahead, you wanted to give us uh, some words and then we have a bunch of uh, questions to ask you. Okay. Why don't we just go ahead? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Professor Chomsky, what prompted you to write this book and who did you hope would read it and be persuaded by it? Well, the book is actually a collection of, uh, mostly a collection of uh, essays over a couple of years. What prompted me to write it is what keeps me going after 80 years of activism. It's uh, since I was a young teenager, the world is in trouble. There are things that have to be done. It's much worse in many ways. I and mean, when I started, it was the great threat to the world was fascism, spread of Nazism. Didn't know it at the time in 1940, but the US government at the time, we now know, was planning for a post-war world in which there would be two major powers, the United States and Nazi Germany. They assumed there would be a German controlled world over much of Eurasia, including Japan, and that the United States would basically take over the former British Empire, and of course, Latin America and parts of Asia and these two forces would confront each other. And the idea that the Nazi horror might actually control most of the world, much of the world was pretty horrifying. Well, come to today, we actually have a much grimmer forecast. Uh, we're now facing the uh, serious likelihood that uh, within another few decades, we will be moving towards true terminal catastrophe. We have a couple of decades in which we can take action to prevent it. If we don't, it may become irreversible and organized human life on earth will essentially come to an end. Uh, that's part of the problem. The other part is that the threats of conflict are significant, escalating throughout much of the world. Uh, there's a, the leading specialists on nuclear, pro nuclear armaments, people like uh, William Perry, former defense secretary, spent his entire life on uh, issues of controlling nuclear weapons. Now, he and others now claim that the threat of nuclear war is maybe even greater than the danger during the Cold War. Well, when this book was written, that was already developing. And uh, the book tries to treat various part problems around the world, 
to ask how they can be addressed and overcome. Who's the book meant for? I would just hope any literate reader. This, these are things that a, uh, an, an engaged, informed public should be taking, should be taking stands on and shaping policy about how well it succeeds is for others to determine, of course. The title of your book poses a provocative question. Um, help us to understand why this is uh, such an important question for us to ask and, and how you would answer it. The title, like any title, is uh, out. It doesn't provide the context. So there isn't any single force that totally rules the world. The world's more complicated than that. But there is a dominant force, very dominant force. Uh, since the end of the Second World War, the United States has had simply overwhelming power, greater power than any uh, state in history. And uh, that's true not only of means of violence, but also of control over wealth of the world. In fact, the United States at the time, back 1945, had maybe half the world's wealth. Uh, just to show you how many, how much things have changed, by now, U.S.-based multinational corporations, based in the United States, own about 50 percent of the world's wealth. So, U.S. global power has, of course, declined from that incredible peak, but it's the power of the U.S. state, including, I mean, in the broad sense of meaning, including the economic institutions and so on, that's remained overwhelming. And the uh, U.S. power, uh, simply to just think of a few examples, uh, what country in the world can impose sanctions on others? Can uh, Germany impose sanctions? Can China impose sanctions? Nobody can do it. I mean, they can try if they want, but they don't amount to anything. Now, the US probably has about a third of the world under sanctions, and they're taken very seriously. You can't disobey them. Uh, the US for 60 years has had uh, severe, harsh sanctions against Cuba. The world is totally opposed to this. Comes up every year at the United Nations in the General Assembly. Can't come up in the Security Council because the US would veto it. But it comes up in the General Assembly and the vote is unanimous against US sanctions on Cuba. The only country that voted for the United States is Israel and they have to. Uh, they violate them, but they have to. Well, does that make any difference? No. The sanctions remain, and other countries have to adhere to them, because these are third-party sanctions. If others don't adhere to them, the U.S. throws them out of the international financial system, which it controls, runs through New York. So if Sweden wants to send medical equipment to Cuba, they can't do it, or they get thrown out of the international system. Same with the sanctions on Iran and so on. Now, no country has anything like that power. That's just overwhelming. And this shows up in case after case. We could talk about it. So who rules the world? Well, nobody completely. But the distribution of power in the world is highly skewed. And at the peak, is the United States, which is, of course, important for us. And in fact, something we should be happy about because it means we're in a position to affect it. If the main center of power in the world were, uh, you know, say uh, Europe, we couldn't do much about it. When it's the United States, if we choose, we can do quite a lot about it. So, and the book goes on 
uh, actually by now I think there are even more striking examples than were discussed in the book. Um, if Don or Eric, if you want to jump in here, I'll, I'll keep asking. Well, I, have, I have a question, Dr. Chomsky. The, um, um, ever since we, we found out that uh, you were going to uh, speak to our class, I think I've been reading everything I can about, about your works and, and, and totally fascinated. I uh, took a look at a summary of a book that you wrote on the media. Uh, it talked about uh, public relations uh, as forming public opinion, molding public opinion, uh, that it's, it's hard to find the truth. Uh, one of your favorite uh, newspapers is Financial Times, which is interesting because we had a very conservative uh, gentleman on the show a couple of weeks ago as a journalist, and he said that's also his favorite uh a source of information. And, um, and my question to you is in light of what's going on with Twitter and Facebook, even though they're privately owned, uh, being accused of or perhaps controlling political media, what your thoughts are on what's happened in, in for lack of a better word, thought control over uh, the life of your career? Well, of course, if you're interested in facts about that you want to know what's happening in the world there's no use looking at twitter or facebook they don't have journalists out there reporting on what's happening in the world uh, facebook uh, provides a, a kind of a summary of headlines but that's just filtering what's already produced by the major media they are the sources of direct information. Uh, first thing I do in the morning is read the New York Times, the world's major newspaper. There are flaws, there are distortions, there are uh, the, 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 the way the world is looked at is shaped by certain perspectives, but you can compensate for them. It's not, it's not quantum physics. You understand the biases and the factors that enter into shaping the way they, what they present and how they present it, you can compensate. But, and that's, of course, not the only source of news. But Twitter and Facebook are not sources. They, they don't tell you anything new. Uh, you can find out things from uh, uh, many internet sources we know are much better off in that respect than years earlier. If you really want to pursue things, you can find lots of different independent uh, analyses and investigations all over the internet. But if you get trapped into what social media lead you into, you're in trouble. It has the effect of directing people into bubbles where you tend to hear what you want to hear and what uh, agrees with you. No one's immune to that. I do it too. I go to sources where I know that I can have some sympathy with the points of view of the people who are running them and the participants. And that can be a danger. And it's becoming a serious danger. It's leading much of the population uh, into bubbles where they hear nothing but what reinforces and confirms their own prejudices and biases. And it's pretty extreme. There have been some studies of it. So for example, uh, the uh, business press, which going back to the Financial Times, it's one of the, tends to be one of the major uh, sources of information, best sources. Business Press ran a study a little while ago of, uh, of where Americans got their news and information. It studied about 30 media, uh, press, television, internet, uh, radio. Uh, I think there are about 30 choices. 
And it just asks people which are, which are the main choices you go to. Well, I'm on, and it's split it in various categories. An interesting split was Democrats, Republicans. Among Democrats, it was a fair distribution of media by, you know, tended towards uh, the ones that are called more liberal, but it was a fair range. Among Republicans, Fox News, Rush Limbaugh, Breitbart, almost nothing else. Well, if that's where your picture of the world is coming from, you're going to have a very strange picture. It's not going to look much like the actual world. Uh, so, for example, you'll assume that uh, uh, heating the atmosphere, global warming, is not a very serious problem. And you'll assume that humans may have nothing to do with it. This is only the most serious problem that has ever arisen in human history. Humans have everything to do with it. And if we don't take command of the issue, we're, we're finished. But if this is your source of news, you may not be aware of that. Now, that's the kind of thing that replicates all over the place in, among activist, left activist groups too. They are nothing but what they want to hear. That's not the way you understand the world. So I think there's, there's a kind of, to divide your question into two parts, the main sources of news, I think, remain pretty much subject to the kinds of analysis that you refer to. But in terms of control of opinion, there are other factors that have entered, like, for example, the effect of being immersed in social media, which, if you use it constructively, can be very helpful, searching for background, for sources, for uh, uh, analyses beyond what you see on the surface. But if you get caught in, into the internet bubbles, it can be quite harmful. Dr. Leader, Dr. Fulcomer, do you have the next question? Ron, I, I don't know. I have a question more about uh, his background, but I don't know if you wanted to go into more about the book. I haven't had the privilege of reading the book. So. Let's, let's talk about this fascinating background. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, Professor Chomsky, I don't think many of us have opportunities to speak with 91-year-old people very often. And uh, sorry to out your age, but it's available on the internet, so I assume it's public, publicly okay to say. So, you know, you're, you're still an amazing uh, scholar. You're still writing. You're still teaching, as I understand. You're still obviously speaking to groups. Here you are speaking to us today. Um, but when I, when I think about scholars and I think about faculty members and uh, professors, they generally are experts in, in a specific topic and they, they hone in their research and their, and their thinking and their writing on one specific topic. But when I read about your background, I see that you're a linguist, a philosopher, a cognitive scientist, historian, social critic, political activist. So you're, you're very, you know, you're very diverse in your, um, in your knowledge, in your writing, in your work. And I'm just curious as to uh, how that developed and, and uh, how you've become such a unique uh, person within uh, academia and within, um, within the world in which you exist. Well, lucky accidents, <laughs> frankly. Uh, I went to, it started when I was two years old. And my parents were working parents, they were educators. They happened to both be interested in uh, Deweyite uh, progressive education. And they, uh, they sent me to school. I, I was, I've been in school ever since I was two years old, 90 years, never left one or another school. Uh, but uh, started at the Deweyite progressive education uh, they had an experimental school run by Temple University, where the School of Education happened to be committed Deweyites. And I stayed there till I was in high school. And it was a very striking formative experience. Uh, Deweyite education was, not, was the opposite of what we have now. Uh, what we have now 
basically is teaching to test uh, so an approach that was ridiculed in the 18th century during the Enlightenment as pouring water into a vessel and then the vessel, the water comes out of it. And it's a very leaky vessel, as we all know. Uh, you can take some course that you have no interest in, uh, work hard enough to get an A in the exam, and uh, a month later you forgot what the course was about because it didn't come from inside. You weren't uh, carrying out the initiative of exploring, inquiring, investigating, and so on. Well, the Deweyite education is the opposite. It was basically encouraging you to, to, it was exploiting the natural curiosity that children have and saying, good, explore it, push your interests for it, move forward, cooperate with others, because that's the best way to move forward. And out of that, comes your education. There was a structured curriculum, like you took the courses that you were supposed to, but they were all designed so as to allow you to develop your creative instincts, abilities, pursue your interests, work in common with others and so on. It was very successful. And uh, I went to an academic high school, which was conventional. Uh, the one high school in the city for kids who planned to go on to college. And it was very boring. It's a dark spot in my memory. I did all the work you were supposed to do, but didn't pay much attention to it. When I got to college, again, I just had a lucky experience. I went to the University of Pennsylvania, which in those days was mostly a football and fraternity school. But there were some, a few scattering of really outstanding faculty in different fields. And I kind of gravitated to them. So I was taking graduate courses in lots, several different fields. I didn't have much of an undergraduate education. And it kind of worked. I was, won't go through the rest, but I was lucky enough to have opportunities all the way through just keep going the same way. Uh, when I got to MIT, I, I was appointed to MIT to teach in 1955. I had no professional qualifications. The field in, of my professional work it didn't exist at the time. It wasn't a field, but they didn't much care. It's a, it was a science-based university. If you're doing work that seems interesting, fine, go ahead and do it and uh, was able to continue to develop, in fact, what became the major global center of modern linguistics, now spread all over the world, was able to initiate a philosophy program, which didn't exist, uh, other programs developed, uh, but it was uh, basically a, a, the, the, the essence of the university is kind of captured in the words of a major world-renowned physicist, uh, Victor Weisskopf, who was famous for his uh, introductory lectures in his freshman physics courses. If students would ask, uh, what are we going to cover this semester? His answer was, uh, it doesn't matter what we cover it matters what you discover. That's what education is. Creating opportunities and incentive for you to discover. Then you'll know it. If you just read it in a book and pass an exam, you won't know it. So the point of education, it's very much along the Dewey eight lines that I learned about when I was two years old. Now, at, a, at the world's leading scientific university where the, basically the same conceptions are followed. What matters is what you discover. And uh, as I say, going back to my personal history, I was just lucky enough to have these opportunities all through my life. Thank you.
Professor. Did you have a follow-up on that, uh, Dr. Fulcomer? Well, I have a hundred follow-ups on that, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I think we'll move on uh, to see. I, I assume that uh, Professor Lee has questions from the students and uh, be interested to see what questions they came up with. I, you know, what you just said, though, makes me want to ask this question. There's so much debate right now about the value of higher education and whether it's worth it and um, and also the value of a liberal arts education. So I, I could discern from what you were saying just now um, where you might stand on that. But could you speak to those questions more directly? How would you, what would you say in the midst of these debates about that? We have, we are the inheritors of a rich, complex culture. And in the modern period today, doesn't anymore just have to be the European tradition. We can draw from Asian, African, indigenous, other rich, wealthy traditions. Now, we could put all that aside and say, I don't care. I don't care about the enormous cultural wealth and richness that's been developed throughout history. I don't care. I just want to get a job. Okay. So all I want to do is get a job and get well paid and have fun. Okay, then forget about uh, the liberal arts, the humanities, uh, uh, the music and philosophy and so on, and just learn how to carry out the, act the narrow range of activities that you'll get paid for. You'll have a very restricted life. Uh, you may make money, but you won't have a life and you won't contribute anything to the world. So the value of higher education is internal to the person who's entering into the educational system. It's what you make of it. The resources are there. State legislators or legislatures are often trying to keep it from being there. If it's a state college, they don't want it. They want you to be uh, trained to be a passive a servant of the business world. But you don't have to accept that. You can decide to forge, to take, uh, to take uh, advantage of the rich resources which are found in any college or university that I've ever seen, and that's many of them, and uh, find them uh, pursue them, develop yourself into a, uh, a, uh, a an individual who's got a who is the proper inheritor of the enormous cultural wealth and achievements of actually thousands of years from many different sources, and you can go on to contribute to it and become a, a person who helps make a, a better world and a richer world with greater understanding, a greater uh, commitment to justice, to fairness, to peace, to welfare, to the common good. Well, you have those choices. Uh, the college does offer the opportunities. You can squander them or you can use them. Um, but the students in the class are very concerned about the um, perception of the world uh, that the world has of the United States today. Um, they, they um, I've heard from them, they worry about the loss of um, America's identity as a land of opportunity for immigrants. Um, and generally America's role in the world is, a, is, is maybe a force for good. Um, can you speak to that, the, the kind of the issue of how the world sees us and, and what we might do differently to help improve the perception? Well, let's start with lack of opportunity for immigrants. Uh, how about lack of opportunity for American citizens? Now, there is an illusion that this is a land of opportunity, and indeed it once was. So when my parents came from very poor villages in Eastern Europe to the United States, 
It was because of a land of opportunity. My father, who came when he was 17, uh, barely knew English, but was able to get a job in a sweatshop uh, sorting rags and within a couple of years to move to the point where he could enter college, uh, ended up getting a PhD, his son, his children go on to professions. That was a land of opportunity. That's changed. Social mobility in the United States is very low. It's less than in comparable countries. Now that's a product of the last 40 or 50 years of social policy, which has created a kind of stagnation throughout the society. This has happened to some extent in other countries too. It's what's called the neoliberal period, kind of an unusually business run period, which has had striking effects on the whole population. One is on social mobility, which has reduced significantly in the United States. Now, how does the world look at us? Well, up until four years ago, the United States did have a, quite a positive image throughout the world. That's changed. By now, the United States, after four years of President Trump, is regarded as a dangerous pariah state. And the world is, most of the world, except for some dictatorships here and there, is trying to figure out how to protect themselves from what they see as a rogue elephant, uh, a country that's just discarding and destroying every international agreement, uh, acting in the, not in the interests of its own citizens, but in the interests of narrow elites within the society and uh, severely harming others. The prestige of the United States has never been so low, even during you know, what were regarded correctly as major crimes, like the destruction of Indochina. But the added perception of the United States has never been so low. Uh, Trump has performed a real job there of uh, undermining uh, the US role in the world. And uh, I should say another four years of that, and it may be gone. It's, uh, and it's not that Americans have benefited uh, this whole period, which the whole 40 year period, let's go back and take a look at it, uh, start, starting around 1980, when Ronald Reagan was elected here, Margaret Thatcher in England, and initiated the policies that are generally called neoliberal policies. And just think what they were, and you can understand what's happened very well, what's happening in the world now. Uh, you go back to Reagan's inaugural address, 1981. Uh, the, he said the main theme is his phrase, uh, the government is the problem, not the solution. Okay, so what is the solution? If the government doesn't make major decisions, they don't stop being made, they just go somewhere else. Well, where do they go? to the private sector, which to concentrated private economic power, that's quite different from government. The government, good or bad, to some extent is accountable to the population. Private power is not as unaccountable to the population. And the significance of this was highlighted right away by the leading uh, economic uh, thinker of the neoliberal period, Milton Friedman, wrote an important, very influential article right at that time, spelling out what he said was the responsibility of private power of corporations. He said the sole responsibility of a corporation is to enrich itself, has no other responsibilities. Well, that became the kind of slogan of the neoliberal period. So put it together. We take decisions away from governments. 
which are partially influenced and to the, by people and accountable to them. We put it in the hands of uh, private concentrations of power whose sole goal and responsibility is to enrich themselves. It doesn't take a genius to figure out what's going to happen. And we've now, after 40 years, seen what happened uh, for very small sectors of the population. There has been extreme concentration of wealth beyond anything in history. For most of the population, stagnation. Uh, real wages are about what they were in 1979. About 70% of the population gets by from paycheck to paycheck. Uh, we've entered into a period unknown in the history of industrial democracy when the population is actually declining. That doesn't happen except for wars and total disasters. And it's declining because of what are called deaths of despair, which hit primarily the white working class. Uh, working class, mostly males, 25 to 50, are just dying because there's nothing in life for them. They die of alcoholism, uh, uh, drugs, uh, whatever. That's never happened before. The last two or three years, the population has actually declined. There's a measure of this. The Rand Corporation, one of the most uh, respected, uh, independent, uh, uh, analytic corporations devoted to analysis of policy and society. They just put out an interesting study in which they tried to estimate how much wealth was transferred from the middle class and the working class, the bottom 90% of the population, how much was transferred from them to the very rich during the neoliberal period. Uh, their estimate is $47 trillion transferred from the lower 90% working class, middle class to the very top. And if you look at who the very top is, it's not the top 10%. There's some benefits there, but it's highly skewed toward the very top, the top 0.1%, 0.1% of the population has doubled its wealth since Reagan from 10% to 20% of total wealth. That means 0.1% of the population now controls 20% of the wealth of the country, which is a spectacular number, sharply increased while everyone else is paying out $47 trillion. Well, that leaves a country where you're not too surprised by death of despair and by anger, uh, resentment, uh, belief in conspiracies, uh, seeking some way of explanation what's happened to us very fertile turf for demagogues who can say follow me i'm your savior and meanwhile continue to stab you in the back and we're seeing that we see it in the united states we've seen it in other countries which have been subject to one or another form of these policies so that's a large part of the world in which we live and it goes right back to social mobility one of the reasons it's sharply declined, but it's much broader than that. Now, how does the world see us? Right now, in the last four years, it sees us as a danger. It doesn't like what we're doing. I mentioned uh, the sanctions on Cuba, which we don't even talk about. The world thinks they're grotesque, but we don't talk about them. Let's take something we do talk about, the sanctions on Iran, and just Notice what happened in the last few weeks, which gives you a good explanation of how the world looks at us. Uh, the United Nations had sanctions against Iran. Uh, they've run out after the United, there was a joint agreement on uh, nuclear weapons policies in Iran. The Trump administration tore it up, said, we don't want it. 
one of the many international agreements they've torn up. Okay, the United States pulled out. Uh, the United Nations sanctions remain, but they just ran out. The United States went to the Security Council of the United Nations and requested that the UN sanctions be renewed. Total opposition. Not a single US ally agreed. The virtual unanimous opposition. So what happened? The Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, returned to the Security Council and said, sorry, folks, the sanctions are reinstituted because we say so. Okay. Right now, there's some legalistic hassle about that. But the point is, if the US reinstitutes the sanctions, other countries have to obey. They don't like it, they oppose it, but they don't have much choice because of US power, in particular, US control over the global financial system. So if, a, you know, say, a, a German bank wants to deal with Iran, they can be thrown out of the international financial system, a devastating blow. So, so guess how the world looks at us? Well, it doesn't take a genius to figure it out. And that's true of most of the world. Now, there are some exceptions, like the uh, Gulf, the, the family dictatorships of the Gulf, uh, Saudi Arabia, United Am Arab Emirates, are the most reactionary dictatorial states in the world. They love it. Uh, Egypt has, uh, is under the rule of the most harsh and brutal dictator of its history, Al-Sisi. Uh, Trump calls him his favorite dictator. Sisi think, thinks it's great. He has great admiration for the United States. A couple of other examples around the world. But uh, general opinions in countries like Europe or Japan or, or other countries, it's increasingly negative, frightened and negative. Don. I have a, I have a follow up when I uh, when I was in Congress, uh, Dr. Chomsky uh, chaired the um, Small Business Committee, and uh, my background is as a conservative Republican. We had a lot of people on that committee with very differing views, and I brought in a, a Professor Alan Kennedy, who had written a book called The End of Shareholder Value. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. Uh, and I also, uh, on that panel, had a professor from Harvard University Law School that talked about social responsibilities of corporations, for example, uh, when thinking about closing up a, um, a facility in a particular city. And this was sort of, uh, I was sort of walking on some glass at that time uh, because uh, some people said, well, how can you question what a corporation does? And I said, well, a corporation is comprised of its shareholders. They should have some say in the operation of the business. But in, in the course of that hearing, uh, there developed uh, sort of a theme, at least for that time, that corporations should become involved in more uh, social responsibility. And to a certain extent, some of them did. But now we have uh, these large corporations, including the people that uh, run uh, the social media and the problems there that uh, what you're saying uh, about size in itself being so great, that's shared by many people on, on both sides of the political spectrum. Well, prior to the neoliberal revolution, 1980, roughly, it was the corporations were under significant control. For one thing, let's take the financial institutions. By now, financial corporations are almost half the economy. And uh, they are the ones who are responsible for the uh, 
recession in 2008-2009, uh, predatory lending policies and so on. At that point, they already had 40% of corporate profits. Let's go back to the pre-1980 period. They weren't there. Pre-1980, banks were banks. It's a place where you, if you had a little extra money, you put it in the bank. Or they would lend it to somebody who was starting a business, uh, wanted to buy a car or something like that. There were virtually no financial crises, nothing serious. Uh, there were no such things as uh, share buybacks. There were no tax havens. There was none of that. It was all illegal. And the uh, Treasury Department enforced it. Uh, not claiming it was utopia. A lot of things were wrong. But that was basically what was called regimented capitalism. The system was more or less under control. Uh, when uh, you know, the head of General Motors said, uh, what's good for General Motors is what's good for the country. It wasn't a total force. There was something to it. Uh, corporations like, say, General Motors were mostly run by people who came out of the engineering profession who knew about the industry and wanted to build the corporation for the future. That's not true today. Now, since the 1980s, increasingly, the corporations are run by people who came out and got an MBA at Harvard Business School. They don't know anything about the industry. They know something about how to manipulate money and make money. Now, take a look at the world's largest corporation, Apple. Uh, when Steve Jobs was running it, founded it. It was, it was focused under his direction on making better profit products. It's not true. Under Tom Cook today, shifting resources to financial speculation and manipulation, because you can make more money that way. The product division is declining. Research and development is declining. Financial manipulations are declining. Uh, you, they don't have to pay taxes because you can set up an office in Ireland and say, that's where my corporation is. And these are all new things that have developed, including incidentally monopolization. One of the effects of the deregulation introduced by, started in late Carter, but then picked up steam with Reagan and his successors, has been one result of this has been that the whole economy has been pretty heavily monopolized. Uh, deregulation on paper sounds like it might lead to competition, has the opposite effect, has the effect that the big fish swallow the small fish and you get more and more concentration. In the tech industry, it's, which you mentioned, it's of course outlandish, but elsewhere too. Well, uh, all, all of these developments uh, have led to a pursuit of the Friedmanite doctrine that the sole role of corporations is simply self-enrichment. So right now, for example, lots of corporations are airlines, others uh, racing to the Treasury Department to ask for bailouts uh, just as they did in 2008, ask for bailouts uh, because of the effect of the pandemic. Well, what were they doing from 2009 to the present when they were making tons of money, very profitable? They weren't using it to build the corporations. They were using it on things like share buybacks and uh, uh, shell companies. Uh, other financial manipulations, which you make a lot of money from. So yeah, now they're broke. Uh, consumer spending goes down, they're in trouble, go to the government for a handout. That's been going on ever since Reagan. Uh, one of his first acts, early acts, was to bail out uh, the Continental uh, Illinois Bank, which was in trouble, new big bailout. Uh, his, his term ended with the uh, uh, savings and loan crisis, huge crisis from 
corporate corruption, which the taxpayer bailed them out for. Uh, then comes along Clinton, you end up with a tech bubble, burst, taxpayer pays for it. We go on to 2008, housing crisis, financial crisis, taxpayer pay, bails them out, then you get the next one. Uh, the, all of these things are pretty predictable results of the structure of the neoliberal policies. Decisions shift the government, government policy is weakened, no more regulation, uh, uh, banks are free to carry out whatever kinds of speculation they want. Uh, if they get into trouble, taxpayer will bail, bail them out. Uh, and the same is true for industry after industry. So there has been growth since 1980. It's not that the economy stopped, continued to grow, not at the pace of earlier years, but it did grow. But that growth went, the profits of that growth went into very few pockets. You look at the graphs of growth and wages, even minimum wage and growth. Up until the late 70s, uh, they're all tracked together as growth increases, wages increase. Starting right at that point, accelerating since 1980, they separate. The growth and productivity continue, not as fast as before, but they do continue. But uh, wages, benefits pretty much stagnate uh, to the extent, if you take the figures apart, the wages are, when you talk about average wages, it's a misleading figure because that takes into account the wage of the CEO who's paid some vast amount. If you take the real figures, say things like median wages, it basically stagnates. And that's why you have the situation you have now. Well, none of this. So what you're saying, in fact, what you're saying is quite interesting because by now the business sector, the top corporate sector is beginning to be seriously concerned about what are called reputational risks. The public doesn't like what we're doing to them. Uh, you may I'm sure you recall a couple of months ago, the, uh, uh, the uh, business roundtable, major business lobbying group, got together, uh, I think, a uh, hundred or so top corporate executives who came out with a statement saying, uh, we recognize that we've failed in our responsibilities to the general public. Uh, we apologize for that. We now realize that we have to be responsive to the needs of what are called stakeholders, community workforce, not just for enrichment. So you can put your trust in us. Well, you never put your trust in anyone in power. You keep acting so that the reputational risk increases and they will become out of necessity, more socially responsible. Take off uh, any, eliminate any barriers eliminate government regulation, eliminate popular pressure, they'll follow the Friedmanite rule, become enrich yourself. Ron, do you have any more questions from students? Um, what, what should the United States do about the problem of the proliferation of nuclear weapons? I mean, you, you, you come back to this issue a lot, this topic in your book, um, and you're critical in, in even some ways blame the United States for causing the problem. Um, what, what can and should be done? Well, one thing that can be done is to enforce the arms control regime. But you can't do that if there's no arms control regime. Okay, It's one of the things that's happened in the past four years. Uh, notice that President Trump has one leading policy which is followed with enormous consist consistency. Any international agreement that he didn't make 
has to be destroyed consistently. Iran negotiations, Paris negotiations on climate. Uh, today, the International Consortium on Creating Vaccines, uh, whatever it is, we have to eliminate it. One was the arms control regime. Uh, uh, Trump, last a year ago, uh, ended the uh, inter INF Treaty, Intermediate Nuclear Weapons Treaty, uh, that was negotiated by Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev, which restricted uh, the development of tactical nuclear weapons in Europe, which are extremely dangerous. Uh, they put a very narrow threshold on the outbreak of war. So they were eliminated, increased safety enormously. Trump dismantled it. Not only dismantled it, but moved immediately to signal to the world that we're finished with it. Immediately launched missiles, which violated the treaty, which basically appeals to others to do the same. Next came the, earlier this year, of the Open Skies Treaty. Well, that goes back to Eisenhower, dismantled and increases the threat of war. Uh, then came threats. Right now, the real question is whether Trump will block renewal of the New START Treaty. That's the last remaining treaty. The Russians have been repeatedly asking for it to be renewed. The Trump administration has refused. Now, in the last couple of days, they seem to be moving towards something. But if you don't have an arms control regime, you're going to get uh, countries uh, producing new and more destructive weapons, and others will want to go into the act too. One country develops nuclear weapons, others who may be antagonistic to it in some way, they'll do it so too. There goes the non-proliferation treaty. When India violated the treaty by building nuclear weapons, didn't take long for Pakistan to follow with US support, incidentally. And that's going to continue. Uh, the, uh, there are ways to restrict proliferation, even short of just banning nuclear weapons, which is what ought to be done. They're much too dangerous. But even short of that, you can restrict the dangers. One of the best ways is by establishing nuclear weapons free zones in various parts of the world. So parts of the world would say, okay, we're going to have no nuclear weapons. That can be quite successful. But let's look at the record. There's a lot in American countries wanted the Western Hemisphere to have to be a nuclear weapons free zone. And in fact, it is from Mexico to the South, but not the United States and Canada. So that's not complete. And what about the Pacific? Pacific region called for a nuclear weapons free zone. At first, it was blocked by France, which wanted to carry out nuclear weapons tests in its territories in the Pacific. They're finished. Now it's blocked by the United States. The United States wants to maintain nuclear weapons facilities in uh, uh, the Pacific Islands and uh, to develop them further. So that treaty is in abeyance. United States won't accept it. Uh, what about Africa? Africa moved to, be, to establish a nuclear weapons free zone. Fine with one exception, the US won't accept it. Uh, part of Africa is uh, the island of Diego Garcia, which the, where the US has built, used to be British, British handed it over essentially to the United States, expelled the population. So the US could construct a huge military base, became uh, prepared for the use of nuclear weapons under Obama in this case, it's been used to bomb uh, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, it's 
constantly in use. So that keeps the African region from consummating its nuclear weapons free zone. Now, the most important one in the world would be the most volatile region, the Middle East. Suppose we could establish a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. Well, for one thing, this would end any alleged threat of Iranian nuclear weapons, which is supposed to be the greatest threat to world peace, according to the United States, not according to others. So this would end it. Is there any way, is there any reason why it's not established? Yeah, there is. It's not the Arab states, but they've been in favor of it for 25 years. Uh, not Iran, which has been calling for it vociferously for years. Not the global south, 130 countries and the former non-aligned countries, strongly in favor of it. Europe's in favor of it. What stops it? us, most recently Obama, every time it comes up in international negotiations, last time was 2015, US vetoes it. Why? The US doesn't want Israel's nuclear weapons to be inspected. In fact, the US does not even recognize officially that Israel has nuclear weapons. Of course it has, everybody knows it. They don't even try to keep it a secret, but the United States doesn't recognize it. And there's a reason for that too. US law bans economic and military aid to countries that have created nuclear weapons outside the framework of the non-proliferation treaty. So if you recognize that Israel has nuclear weapons serious questions would arise about all of US, uh, enormous US aid to Israel. Nobody, elite groups don't wanna open that door. So notice what's happening. We're maintaining what we call the greatest threat to world peace because we're not willing to agree with the rest of the, with the region and the world that we can establish a nuclear weapons free zone. Well. That's one way to cut back proliferation. If you make it impossible, of course you can't use it. And notice incidentally that this is never discussed in the United States. Of course, never is too strong. It's discussed in arms control journals. Uh, people like me discuss it, but it can never make it to the media. This is total uniformity kind of censorship you could barely achieve in a totalitarian state, and not on a small issue, on an issue that threatens seriously the outbreak of a major war, which could be quickly turned into a nuclear war. But silence reigns. So going back to your earlier question about control over opinion, here's a pretty dramatic example of it. We do not have to accept that. We can move, the public can move forward to place such issues on the public agenda. That would make a big difference. So about non-proliferation, a lot that we can do, but not if we sit quietly at home. We have to keep actively engaged in, first of all, informing yourself. It's not impossible, it takes a little work helping others to inform themselves, create active political organizations which deliberate, work out policy, find out ways to organize, and then proceed to do it. That's the way changes take place. Stay at home on your computer, looking at uh, Facebook, nothing happens. Here, do you have another question? I do. Um, Professor Chomsky, another topic that's very popular um, today or is very important today is, is uh, free speech and being able to, and supporting free speech even when we don't agree with it, even when we find it abhorrent. And uh, having read about your, your history, I believe that you are a proponent of free speech even when you don't agree. Can you, 
you could confirm that, I guess. And then if you could just talk to us a little bit about uh, the threats you see to free speech today and what our role is in higher education and as educated citizens to uh, make sure that free speech continues to be something we value. Well, I'd modify that statement only in, with a friendly amendment. Okay. So not only we defend free speech when we don't like what's expressed, but that's the primary way we express interest in free speech. Everybody's interested in freedom of speech for views they like, <laughs> even Hitler and Stalin. So the question of free speech arises precisely when it's views you don't like. And either you say, okay, I don't like them, but they're freely expressed and you believe in free speech, or you say, I don't like them, I'm gonna stop them. And you're opposed to free speech. You're taking the views of Stalin and Hitler, for example. Now that's the constant choice and a hard choice sometimes because it means I'm saying, okay, speech that I think is uh, abhorrent, even dangerous, but either I accept freedom of speech or I reject it. And if I accept it, I accept it for those views. Now that doesn't mean you're silent about them. So let's take a concrete case. I suppose some group at, at, the, at the Rockford invites to the campus uh, somebody who a large part of the student body has views that they think are abhorrent and shouldn't be expressed. Well, they have two choices. One is to try to break up the meeting, prevent the person from coming onto campus. Uh, that's one way that says, I oppose freedom of speech for views I don't like. There's another way, which is both principled and helpful, principled and constructive. That is to say, okay, let the person come, set up educational programs, which expose what the person is saying, criticize and condemn it, use it as a basis for moving forward to counter those ideas. That's positive. It's a learning experience, provides a basis for really doing something about those ideas. If you take the first mode, kick them off campus, you're just giving them, a, aside from being unprincipled, it's tactically point stupid. It's just giving them a gift, they love it. Then they can say, look, I'm a great defender of freedom of speech and these neo-Nazis don't let me speak. That gives them credibility and they love it. You see it all the time. In fact, uh, President Trump's practically building his campaign on it now. It's a great gift to the people you're protesting to say, I'm going to keep you off campus. So tactically suicidal, wrong in principle. And there are things you can do that are right in principle and that are constructive and helpful. So do those. And uh, this uh, generalizes to all sorts of cases. There is a serious threat. There's a threat of, first of all, we should bear in mind that suppression of views that are not liked is standard, absolutely standard within the establishment. Take what I just said about nuclear weapons free zones ending the major th one of the major threats to war that's a hundred percent bored in the information system now it's a free country so they don't put you in jail for saying it i can say it to you i can talk about it to other groups but that's about the limit the establishment institutions say that's it can't go further than that and they often go much farther than that. And people lose their jobs, careers are destroyed, uh, books are destroyed. I could give you a long list of things that happens all the time. And nobody pays much attention because it's mostly against, it's almost always against left dissidents, who cares? For the left to join into this is just 
suicidal and unprincipled. And it's uh, devastating to see the people who call themselves on the left, progressive, whatever you, word you want to use, they should be supporting freedom of speech strongly. It's, it's, their, it's their weapon for dealing with crises and problems and issues that have to be changed. Don't undermine. Professor Chomsky, a student asked a question that touches on kind of both uh, different areas, one year background in linguistics and, and also um, world politics. And they asked this, um, currently the English language is the lingua franca of the world. Um, what influence does that have um, on the privileged place that Anglo-Americans have in the world today? Well, the privileged status of English is the results of the distribution of global power uh, up until from about the 18th century, up until the outbreak of the Second World War, uh, the most powerful state in the world was England. France was second and large parts of the world. France, French is still the international language. So in West Africa, for example, the countries are what are called Francophone, the language of diplomacy, of education, culture, and so on is French, reflection of French colonial power. For most of the world, it's English because of English imperial power. Well, in 1945, the United States basically displaced England, became by far the most powerful country, so England English is spread over the world. I can des describe this with a personal anecdote. But when I got to MIT in 19, before 1945, the main centers of science, uh, philosophy, uh, the arts, the literature were Europe. The United States was kind of a cultural backwater. It was the richest country in the world. But if you wanted to study physics, you went to Germany. You want to study philosophy, go to England. You want to be a writer or an artist, go to France. Second World War changed that. Europe was devastated. The US grew enormously. The end of the war was the world dominant power. Well, the, the tradition of European domination, cultural and scientific domination remained. So when I got to MIT in 1955, uh, one of the things I was doing was teaching cram courses to graduate students in French and German so that they could fake their way through French and German reading exams. They were never gonna look at French and German again in their lives. But before World War II, if you wanted to be a scientist or an engineer, you were going to have to read French and German. So that remained for about 10 years, kind of, you know, just uh, took a while for reality to set in. Of course, by now it's all forgotten. Now, if you're in Europe, you study English, uh, but that's a reflection of world power. If uh, the, the US continues to decline, continues in the direction that Trump is driving it towards decline, isolation, others taking over, it's going to shift again. Uh, so uh, uh, I think it's simply a reflection of power relations. What, what would, what might you, ex what might, might we expect in a, uh, a Biden uh, administration's foreign policy? Do you see any substantive changes? Well, let alone, I wouldn't expect it to change me. I mean, it won't be a wrecking ball. So what'll stop is wrecking everything. Uh, Biden will presumably integrate the United States back into the world system. But for really positive changes, like say what I just mentioned about Iran or Cuba or many others, he won't move in that direction unless force. Popular pressure can make a big difference. 
We've seen that all the time. It doesn't matter who's president. That takes a uh, Richard Nixon, you know, not my favorite character, but he was in fact uh, pretty much the last liberal president, uh, not out of choice, out of public pressure, coming out of the activism of the 60s and the aftermath. Uh, he put through uh, environmental protection laws, uh, health and safety laws for working people, uh, other liberal measures. Uh, the neoliberal regression has been trying to dismantle them, but he put them through under popular pressure. The same with Reagan. Uh, in the early 1980s, there were enormous demonstrations, biggest in American history, against the threat of nuclear war and development of nuclear weapons. Now that had its effect on the Reagan administration, has to, just as it does on corporations, as we were talking before. It's one of the factors that led Reagan to agree with Gorbachev on uh, sharply reducing the threat of war in Europe with the INF Treaty, Intermediate Range Nuclear Weapons Treaty. Uh, and the same is true throughout. It goes back to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, Roosevelt, if it hadn't been for the militant labor organizing formation of the CIO, large-scale strikes, uh, lots of other political activism, he would never have been able to push through the New Deal measures. He was kind of sympathetic. He wasn't opposed to them. But he said straight out, force me to do it by your political action. Otherwise, I can't. And that's true of just about everything. Uh, women, women's rights, uh, gay rights, uh, anything you can think of. If it isn't for the constant public pressure, nothing happens. Power just retreats to its own interests. And that's true on foreign policy as well. There are a lot of things that should be dealt with. For one thing, the enormous threat of global warming is an international issue. Global warming doesn't have boundaries. It's got to be treated internationally. Pandemic is an international issue. Again, no borders. The nuclear weapons, international issue. Uh, peace in the Middle East, ending the enormous threat in the, in the Middle East. Everybody's involved. You can go through the list. Almost any major problem is international in scope. A foreign policy ought to be dealing with this. And there are very specific cases, like right now, for example, the United States is up to its ears in involvement in what's generally called the worst human rights cross humanitarian crisis in the world, the war in Yemen. The US is providing Saudi Arabia with advanced military equipment, fancy bombing planes, uh, uh, high technology equipment, uh, even providing them with intelligence to carry out the destruction of Yemen, which is could be almost terminal pretty soon. But we don't have to do that. We can pull back from that. And uh, many other things can be dealt with. Take the what we call the immigration crisis. Why are people fleeing across the border, not far from where I live, uh, going into the, de the harsh desert, uh, 100 degrees heat, uh, dying of uh, thirst in the desert, thousands of people dying. Well, they're not dying because they want to be here. They're dying because they can't live in their own countries. Why can't they live in their own countries? To a large extent because of American foreign policy which has devastated those countries and continues to do so. So a humane and even effective for us foreign policy would be to reconstruct the countries we've destroyed so the refugees don't flee from them. everybody's interest. And you can think of this across the board. Yes, there are follow foreign policy questions all the time. Being the most powerful country in the world gives us the opportunity to do something about them. 
that others don't have. Not everywhere. And we can't do anything, unfortunately, about harsh repression in China. We can object to it, should object to it, expose it, but there's not a lot you can do about it. Other places, there is a lot we can do. Dr. Uh, Chomsky, I, uh, perhaps this would be the last question. And it, it might be a good question and answer to end on. I think in your book on, on the media, you talked about the absolute necessity of remaining positive and upbeat, um, even in light of all the, the bad things that we see going on in the world. And you've seen a lot of things in, in, in your years. Um, and it's, in light of the things that you have spoken about, you always have that attitude of, for people to look, about, look on the bright side, uh, that there is a future. And, uh, could, and especially for our students, could, could you address that? actually pretty simple. I mean, you have two choices. You can say, it's all hopeless. I give up. Uh, you can then, you're helping ensure that the worst will happen. Or you can say correctly that there are opportunities. Every single topic we've talked about, uh, environmental catastrophe, nuclear war, uh, uh, torture of other countries, everything you mentioned, they all have feasible solutions. There are opportunities if you grasp them. So you can say, I'm an optimist. I'm going to grasp the opportunities that exist. Maybe I'll help make it a better world. So the choices are, I'm going to help destroy the world or I'm going to use the opportunities that exist and they do to make it a better world. That's not much of a choice. Thank you. Professor Lee? No, thank you so much. We really appreciate the students, uh, appreciate your taking the time. What, a, what an honor and a privilege. I can't thank you enough. Thank you. It's been thank you, Professor Chomsky. Thank you so you much, here. sir.